The company name was very fitting for the studio of their stature, up in space with astronomical achievements. Sadly, the stars formed into comets and fell to Earth. They had earned themselves some critical achievements, and with several award-winning movies, brought tears into our eyes, gave us some laughs, and even blew us away with hardcore action. The big names include Dudley Moore, Woody Allen, Oliver Stone, Kevin Costner, Roddy Dangerfield, among others. All backed by experienced men with an incredible history of delivering the goods. But at the Hollywood dinner table, if you want the best meal, you'll have to squeeze your way past the big hogs to devour everything. They managed to score themselves a few slaps of steak and potatoes, but eventually would go hungry and starve. This is the story of a company that earned themselves big time points in the movie industry, but eventually bought them out. This is the rise and fall of Orion. The tale of Orion begins at the Hollywood studio United Artists on January 1978. Three men, Chairman Arthur B. Krim, President, CEO Eric Pleskow, and Chairman of the Financial Committee Robert S. Benjamin quit the company to scroll over the business practices of Transamerica, the then owner of United Artists. Two decades earlier, in 1951, Krim and Benjamin became heads of the studio, then failing. Under their management, however, United Artists became a major horse in Hollywood, turning out many hits, including It's a Mad, Mad, Mad World, In the Heat of the Night, Fiddler on the Roof, and One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, as well as putting forth several big movie franchises, including The Pink Panther, Rocky, the Sergio Leone Clint Eastwood Spaghetti Westerns, and the biggest of all, the James Bond movies. In 1967, being red hot, 98% of UA's stock was bought by the San Francisco insurance giant Transamerica. While throughout the late 60s and the 70s, as they had more successes, behind the scenes conflict went on with the UA heads and Transamerica chairman Jack Beckett. With things such as Beckett wanting to phase out the UA name to call it Transamerica Films, UA wanted to spin itself off into a separate company, being rejected by Beckett, and Transamerica wanted the medical records of the UA heads, much to the display of Pleskow. He along with Krim and Benjamin became fed up, and around this time, an article came up in Fortune magazine highlighting the clash, and Jack Beckett said if they didn't like the treatment, then they should resign. On January 13, 1978, that was exactly what happened. Krim, Pleskow, and Benjamin left, and three days later, senior vice presidents William Bernstein and Mike Medavoy followed suit. Shortly afterwards, 60 important Hollywood players took out a trade ad warning UA they had made a fatal mistake letting the five men leave. The prophecy came true a few years later when the movie Heavenscape was released and bombed so bad, Transamerica cleansed itself of UA, leading to be acquired by MGM. But that would be another rise and fall story for another time. Meanwhile, Krim, Pleskow, Benjamin, Bernstein, and Metavoy were in Orion Pictures that February, naming the company based on the five men thinking the constellation Orion had five stars. In reality, it had seven. While they couldn't get their constellations down, they did manage to get themselves a distribution deal with Warner Brothers. Warner would release their films and hold on to the rights to those movies while Orion financed their projects and let the filmmakers have total creative control. They had a $100 million bank line of credit, so money wasn't much of an issue as well as having free reign over distribution advertising. Quickly, Orion became a major player, having several contracts signed with actors such as John Travolta, John Voight, Burt Reynolds, Jane Fonda, Peter Sellers, and James Caan. Directors such as Francis Ford Coppola and Blake Edwards, writers John Millis, singer Peter Frampton, producer Ray Stark, as well as the distribution deal of Emmy Films. And with 15 films in production, the five heads were making the quick push to make Orion a major. 1979 came around, and that April began bittersweetly, as one of the original founders, Richard S. Benjamin, passed away. Despite this, Orion would release their first movie around this time, A Little Romance, 
a romantic comedy based on the novel E equals MC squared Mon Amour by Patrick O'Van. And starring a 14-year-old Diane Lane in her film debut. Lane is an intelligent American girl, Lauren King, living in France with her family and meets a street smart French boy named Daniel Michel, played by Thelonious Bernard. They hit it off and make a trip to Venice, hoping to seal their love. The film also stars screen legend Laurence Olivier as Julius Edmund Santorin, a gentleman and a storyteller the two kids befriend. When released on April 27, 1979, it was no winner with audiences or critics. But over time, the critical response improved. While not exactly a strong start, they moved on to their next film, Over the Edge, a film about teenagers in a rec center in a drab town who begin a rebellious turn to drugs, alcohol, and violence. The movie stars Michael Eric Kramer, Pamela Ludwig, Harry Northrup, and a 15-year-old Matt Dillon making his film debut. Around the time of its release on May 18, 1979, there was controversy involving films with a gay member theme, most notably The Warriors. Orion, being afraid of bad press, only showed the film in a few theaters. While not a winner at the box office, Over the Edge became popular with TV airings in the 1980s and is well regarded as a cult classic. With two losses, Orion will hope their next film, The Wanderers, will be a hit. The film takes place in 1963 Bronx, centering around a gang of Italian-American teenagers and their struggles with the gang, the Four Hambaldis. Directed by Philip Kaufman, who had recently held the 1978 remake of Invasion of the Body Snatchers and would find more success with The Right Stuff and Rising Sun, and starring Kevin Wall, John Frederick, Karen Allen, and Tony Kalem, The Wanderers was released on July 4, 1979 and was a hit the upstart studio needed, making $23 million. However, over time the film would gain more of an audience. So much so, Warner Brothers re-released the film in theaters in 1996, again yielding another cult classic. Next up, Orion would handle U.S. distribution of the film Life of Brian, featuring the famed British comedy group Monty Python with Terry Jones. Life of Brian centers around Graham Chapman as Brian Cohen, a Jewish man born on the same day as Jesus Christ and lived next door to him with people mistaking Brian for the Messiah. Given the subject matter, the movie caused controversy with Christian organizations, calling the film blasphemous. In spite of this, Life of Brian was released on August 17, 1979 and was another success for Ryan, making $20 million, five times his $4 million budget, and is deemed a comedy classic. Brian continue on with their next time. film, Time After Time. The science fiction film features Malcolm McDowell as British author H.G. Wells in 1890s London, showcasing a time machine to dinner guests. However, complications abound when the infamous serial killer Jack the Ripper goes through the time machine and ends up in 1979 San Francisco, leaving H.G. Wells to pursue him. Also starring David Warner as the killer, and Mary Steenbergen as H.G.'s love interest Amy. Time After Time was released on August 31st, 1979 and made $13 million. While no winner financial-wise, critics praised the film and again would find an audience, becoming another cult film. On a scale from one to ten, having some ups Blake and downs, presents but not having anything ten. big, Ryan hoped to change her fortunes with a film called Ten. Released by famed comedy director Blake Edwards, who had major success with the Peter Seller Pink Panther movies, the movie stars British comedian Dudley Moore as George Webber, a man going through a midlife crisis when he spots Bo Derrick in her first major film role as Jenny Hanley, a beautiful newly wedded woman that George becomes infatuated with and leads to him pursuing her. Also starring Julie Andrews as George's frustrated girlfriend Sam, Tim was released on October 5th, 1979 and was praised by critics and audiences, not to mention making stars out of Moore and Derek. On the movie's $7 million budget, 10 made $74 million, becoming Orion's first home run, as well as being one of 1979's top 10 highest grossing movies. For their next movie, Orion attempted more artful flair with the Grey Centini, based on a 1976 novel of the same name by Pat Conroy, and starring Robert Duvall and Michael O'Keefe. Taking place in a South Carolina town in peacetime 1962, 
Right before U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War, the film showcases the father and son struggles between Duval's Bull Meacham, a war pilot and something of an alpha male, and O'Keefe's more sensitive Ben Meacham. The Great Santini came out on October 26, 1979 and was praised heavily by critics, even earning Oscar nominations by both Duval and O'Keefe for Best Actor and Best Supporting Actor, respectively. Despite this, The Great Santini failed at the box office, making $4 million, all due to bad marketing. Warner Brothers had thought the lack of bankable actors, never mind that Robert Duval was in it, and the subject matter was hard to work with, and a fresh post-Vietnam era where the deer hunter hit it big. But hey, we're not fancy movie executives, aren't we? The marketing game plan for The Great Santini was not like more traditional releases, starting off in New York and letting the positive word of mouth build before a wider release. Instead, the movie was released around the Carolina states, which didn't make a financial impact. Due to the thinking that the name The Great Santini was thought of involving around a circus act, the movie went through several renames with the film showing around Indiana and Illinois. The film would take the name The Ace, but even under its new name, it still wasn't well watched and the movie was quickly pulled in a cable rights zone. But the higher ups still had faith in the film and a little later on it was released in New York under its original name. The film did respectable the first week in the Big Apple. But shortly after, debut on HBO and business dwindled hard. The botched marketing of the Great Santini would become a bad habit for Orion for the years to come, although not as awful as this poor animal. On November 2nd, 1979, Orion ended the year with Promises in the Dark, a tragic tale about Dr. Alexander Kendall, played by Marsha Mason, feeling down with her own personal problems when she meets 17-year-old Buffy, played by Kathleen Beller, a young girl dying of cancer and their friendship alongside the conflicts going on in the hospital, also starring Ned Beatty and Susan Clark. The critics panned the movie and the film goers ignored it, ending an up and down first year for Orion. While not too bad, they hoped 1980 would bring more fortune. Unfortunately, 1980 would not be a stellar year for Orion. Their output for the year included Simon, the company with Alan Arkin as a brainwashed scientist hijacking TV signals to become a big star. Die laughing about a cab driver with a monkey that can make nuclear bombs. Heartbeat, based on an autobiography on the road by Carolyn Cassidy. The finished plot of Dr. Fu Manchu, about the titular evil genius played by Peter Sellers in his final film role, who died in the same year. And The Awakening, with Charlton Heston as an archaeologist whose daughter gets possessed by an evil Egyptian queen and to save the world has destroyed her. In the Orion Minds, all of those movies would be pyrite. What is pyrite, you ask? Fool's gold! Luckily, one little golden nugget will be found in those shafts. A movie that went by the name of Caddyshack. Caddyshack was the first film directed by the late Harold Ramis, who would go on to a very successful career in writing and directing such films, including Ghostbusters, Groundhog Day, and analyze this. Prior to Caddyshack, Ramis had written Animal House and Meatballs for great success and would finally get a chance to helm his own film. Caddyshack centers around Michael O'Keefe as a young caddy who works at the fancy Bushwood Country Club to raise money to go to college, or at least the film did center around him at first. The spotlight would be taken by the more eccentric members and staff of the club, including Chevy Chase's Ty Webb, the new age golf guru, Ted White as the pompous Bushwood co-founder Judge Elihu Smells, Ronnie Dangerfield as Al Chervik, the obnoxious new member at Bushwood who would clash with Smells, and Bill Murray as Carl Spackler, the goofy groundskeeper involved in a full-fledged war with a gopher. The idea of the movie was based on Harold Ramis and the Murray brothers, Brian, Bill, and John, experiences working as caddies in their younger years. The script was written by Ramis and Brian Doyle Murray, along with Douglas Kenny. The scene with Smells getting hit in the nuts with a golf ball by Chervik actually happened to Ramis in real life. And the Baby Ruth scene, where someone threw a Baby Ruth bar in the swimming pool, being mistaken for a piece of poop, happened to Doyle Murray while in high school. The script was written by Ramis and Brian Doyle Murray, alongside Douglas Kenny, and was filmed in the fall of 1979. 
originally set to revolve around Michael O'Keefe's character, the Caddy Danny, the film changed majorly with the more comedic cast getting bigger roles, leading to the movie's improvisational atmosphere, much of O'Keefe's annoyance as well as Ted Knight. The golf scenes were filmed in Rolling Hills Golf Club, now known as Grand Oaks Golf Club, in Davie, Florida. The scene where Chevik's boat destroying Smell's dinghy was filmed in Biscayne Bay in Miami. This, the dinner and dancing scene was filmed at the Boca Raton Hotel and Club in Boca Raton, Florida. And the famous Baby Ruth scene was filmed at the pool of the Plantation Country Club in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Murray's role as Spackler was unscripted. He improvised a lot of his scenes, including his Cinderella story and the story with the Dalai Lama. Originally intended as a small role, the crew loved Murray so much they would keep calling him back to do more scenes, all while in New York, still a cast member on SNL. And one more tidbit, the scene where Ty Webb hit a ball through Carl's shack was not an original script, and Remus wanted it so Murray and Chase can do a scene together. There was some bitterness between the two, after they had gotten to a fist fight one time when Chevy hosted SNL, but during the production of Caddyshack, they had some amnesty towards each other, right in the scene with Ramis during the lunch break. This would be the only movie Murray and Chase would do together. Caddyshack was released on July 25, 1980. While the critics didn't react too warmly to the movie, the moviegoers loved it, making it successful at the box office making almost $40 million on its $6 million budget, and to this day is widely regarded as one of the greatest comedies of all time. Eight years later, Warner Brothers will make a sequel with a new cast, with only Chase reprising his role. In direct contrast to the film, Caddyshack 2 bombed and is deemed one of the worst comedies ever. While overall a bad year for Orion, they did at least introduce a comedy classic, and they had that going for them, which is nice. 1981 was not another kind year for Orion, as more underperformance came out, including Spinks, the adventure film based on a Robin Cook novel. The Hand, a horror film and an early Oliver Stone flick about a man who loses his hand and a hand that gets murderous. Was Oliver Stone terrified of Dane from the Addams Family? Anywho, Wolfen, based on the Whitley Schreiber novel about killers who think are wolf people. Under the Rainbow, the 1930s period picture with Chevy Chase and Carrie Fisher about a Hollywood hotel with spies, assassins, terrorists, and midgets who plan to audition for The Wizard of Oz. Rollover, a thriller about an Arab oil company who wants to wreak havoc on the world economy that stars Jane Fonda and Chris Christopherson. Orion would reject Raiders of the Lost Ark due to budget issues, instead going to Paramount Pictures, where it became a huge hit for them. They missed out on that big time, and would have elevated them up from a year that wasn't too stellar. Just look at 1984. They could have had Amadeus, The Terminator, and Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom. Let's go even more forward to 1989. They would release Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade, instead of that Weird Al picture, which we will go into more detail later on. But such as Hollywood, where missed opportunities are commonplace. Despite this decision, they do have a few films to make note of. Excalibur is a swords and sorcery epic retelling the story of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, with John Borman, responsible for Point Blank and Deliverance, directing, producing, and being a co-writer. Among the cast was Nigel Terry as Arthur, Helen Mirren as Logan Maffei, Nicholas Clay as Sir Lancelot, Sherry Lunkey as Queen Guinevere, Paul Jeffrey as Sir Percival, and Nicol Williamson as Merlin, and also featured Patrick Stewart, Gabriel Byrne, and Liam Neeson. Excalibur took 12 years to make it to the screen. Borman originally opted to have the film made a United Artist, but rejected it due to its high cost. And ironically, with some UA staff finding Orion, he would end up taking the project, but no regrets there. Excalibur was released on April 10, 1981, and while critics dissed the film as all style but no substance, it was a hit with audiences, making $34 million on its $11 million budget. Dudley Moore would play the titular Arthur Bach in the comedy film Arthur, centering around a drunken millionaire who is destined to marry Susan Johnson, portrayed by Jill Eikenberry, a high-class daughter of a wealthy businessman, but instead would meet Liza Minnelli's Linda Morola, who saved her hide after being caught shoplifting and would date. Arthur falls for Linda and wants her, 
despite his family pushing him to marry Susan. The film is noted for the song Best That You Can Do, performed by Christopher Cross, who will win an Oscar for Best Original Song. Also starring John Gielgud as Arthur's butler Hobson, a role which would net him an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. Fame musician Burt Bacharach will also do the music score for this film. This will be the only film directed by Steve Gordon, who also wrote the script and would sadly die a year later of a heart attack at age 44. Arthur was released on July 17, 1981. Critics and audiences loved the movie, breaking in $95 million on a $7 million budget, making this a home run for the desperate Orion. Arthur would see a sequel eight years later in Arthur 2 on the rocks, which flopped so badly, Dudley Moore disowned the movie. It would be remade in 2011 with Russell Brand in its auto role. Like the sequel, the remake also did poorly. Prince of the City is a cop drama based on the real life exploits of NYPD officer Robert Lucci, who exposed police corruption. It was directed by Sidney Lewitt, who churned out such classics such as 12 Angry Men, Serpico, Dog Day Afternoon, and Network. Treat Williams leads as narcotics officer Daniel Cello, a cop with questionable techniques who will be confronted by internal affairs, who was combating police corruption. In exchange for being left off the hook, Cello would help investigate the corrupt happenings of the NYPD, which makes him wonder, who can he trust? Also starring Jerry Orbach, Richard Forney, and Lindsey Krause, Prince of the City was released on August 21st, 1981. It was well received, but another bad market ploy would doom the film. Due to the cost, Orion didn't have uh, commercials for TV, instead option for print advertising, which even included a three-page spread in the New York Times. Unfortunately, with the television medium being more high-profile than magazines and newspapers, not everyone got to hear of Prince of the City, underperforming at $8 million, not quite making back the $8.6 million budget. Orion would end the year with Sharky's Machine, with Burt Reynolds performing double duty as the, both the lead role and the director. Based on William Deal's 1978 novel, Tom Sharkey is a narcotics officer who ended up demoted to Vice Squad after a drug bust gone bad. Sharkey would form a team called Sharky's Machine, where they take the case of a mob murder involving prostitution and the government. The cast included Brian Keith, Bernie Casey, and Richard Libertini as Sharky's men. Rachel Warda as a prostitute, who would become Sharky's love interest, and Henry Silva and Vittorio Gassman as the antagonists. Sharky's Machine was released on December 18, 1981 with good reviews, and was a hit, making $35 million. 1982 would be a big year for Orion business-wise. After some ups and downs, Orion was looking forward to being on their own, and for that first step, they needed their own distribution network. Early in the year, they severed their distribution ties with Warner Brothers and began shopping around for potential suitors. They looked at allied artists and embassy pictures before it was decided on Filmways. Filmways had its most success in the 1960s, producing CBS's rural comedies The Beverly Hillbillies, Green Acres, and Petticoat Junction, as well as the sitcoms Mr. Ed and the Addams Family. They had even ventured into the film business, with such notable movies including The Cincinnati Kid, Save the Tiger, Dress to Kill, Blowout, and Death Wish 2. The company even became something of a big owner, whose assets included the Sears Point Raceway, now the Sonoma Waste Ray, in Sonoma, California, the book publisher Grosset and Dunlap, the animation studio Ruby Spears Productions, and the film studio American International Pictures. However, by 1981, Filmways was on the verge of bankruptcy. To help themselves out, they sold off Sears Point Raceway, Grosset and Dunlap, and Ruby Spears to various companies from 81 to 82. Orion bought the company in February 1982 for $26 million with the help of New York investment house E.M. Warburg Pincus and Company and HBO, which got the pay TV and cable rights. Under Orion, Filmways was restructured, letting go of 80% of the Filmways people and bringing in 40 of Orion's, including 15 executives. That June, Filmways would be renamed Orion Pictures Corporation. On top of this, Orion would form its television division, Orion Television. The TV unit produced several TV movies, but would be best known for the CBS crime drama Cagney and Lacey, with Tyne Daly and Sharon Gless as the titular police duo. 
Starting off as a film waste production, before Ryan took over, Cadney Lacey had a successful run with 7 seasons and 125 episodes. While expanding their business ventures, Ryan would have another bad year in the film front. Their offerings that year were the Francis Ford Coppola production The Escape Artist, starring Ryan O'Neill's son Griffin O'Neill as an escape artist investigating the death of his father, a Midsummer Night sex comedy. A sex comedy set in the 1900s, starring, written, and directed by Woody Allen, who had found much success at United Artists and would frequently collaborate with the Ryan in the future. Hammett, another Zoetrope production, a noir film centering around a fictionalized version of writer Dashiell Hammett, as portrayed by Frederick Forrest. This would be the last Ryan film distributed by Warner Brothers. Amityville 2, The Possession. The sequel to the Amityville Horror, Split Image, a movie about an athlete, played by Michael O'Keefe. <sighs> that poor guy, Michael O'Keefe. Trying to make it big, but still couldn't catch a break. Tiss, tiss, Michael O'Keefe. We hardly knew ye. While the 1982 front had some big names and Michael O'Keefe headline in their movies, they didn't bring in the dough, but would end the year on a strong note, being the distributor of First Blood. The very first movie from Mario Kassar and Andrew G. Vajna's Kuroko Pictures. We pretty much covered it in the rise and fall of Kuroko, but we'll give you a Cliff Notes version. Sylvester Stallone plays Rambo, a Vietnam veteran and drifter who wanders into a small town, much to the eye of Brian Dennehy's Cher Teasel. He drove him out of town and told him not to come back. Rambo does so anyway and gets arrested by Teasel. Under custody, Rambo gets abused by the other cops which triggers Vietnam flashbacks causing him to go mad and escape, where it ends up being Rambo versus the town. Based on David Morrell's 1972 novel, the film went to several studios before Kuroko acquired it. First Blood will also star Richard Crana as Colonel Troutman, Rambo's superior in Vietnam, and one that can hope to talk sense into the great soldier. First Blood was released on October 22, 1982, becoming well received and making 125.2 million worldwide. It would spawn three sequels and a cartoon series. After a year of crap, at least now Orion had a smashing success to call their own. 1983 would once again see Orion expanding business-wise. Orion Classics would be launched, founded by people who formerly ran United Artists Classics. Orion Classics would be the art house division, distributing foreign and independent movies as well as making their own productions. Noble films from the division included Babette's Feast, Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown, Mystery Train, and Slacker. Despite taking major steps to set themselves up to become a major, Orion still had more lows to go through in 1983. They began with an April 15, 1983 release of the Chuck Norris actioner Low Wolf McQuaid. Norris plays the title character, a Texas Ranger who squares off with David Carradine's Raleigh Wilkes. Lone Wolf McQuaid was well received, with some comparisons to the spaghetti westerns of Sergio Leone and made some money. $12 million on a $5 million budget. They went on to their next film, the Richard Gere thriller Breathless. A remake of the 1960 French film of the same name, Gere portrays a Las Vegas criminal on his way to LA. On the way, he gets pulled over by a cop. Panicking, Gere shoots him and moves on. Therefore, the cops get on his case throughout the whole film. The movie also features French actress Valerie Kapriski as Jeer's love interest. Breathless came out in theaters on May 13, 1983, and with reviews being divided, it did achieve cult status, with even Quentin Tarantino calling it one of the coolest movies ever. On a $7 million budget, Breathless was a slight hit, making $19 million. To kick off the summer, Ryan put out the comedy Yellowbeard with Monty Python's Graham Chapman in his directorial debut. Starring in a title role, Chapman is a pirate who gets out of prison to get back his lost treasure. But comic complications abound, with the authorities wanting the treasure and one of his crew members betraying him, leading to a conflict to see who gets the treasure. The cast features a blend of American and British comedic talent, including Peter Boyle, Cheech and Chong, Peter Cook, Marty Feldman, Martin Hewitt, Michael Hordern, Eric Idle, Madeline Kahn, James Mason, and John Cleese. This will also be the first Orion film produced by the Hendale Film Corporation, the British company ran by John Daly and would be key in the future success of Orion. However, 
Yellowbeard was no hit. Critics were mixed, feeling the mix of American and British humor didn't work well. On top of that, Trading Places came out two weeks before it and was still popular. Released on June 24, 1983, Yellowbeard bombed, only making $4 million. Ryan took another stab at comedy in the summer with the sex comedy class featuring Andrew McCarthy, Rob Lowe, John Cusack, and Virginia Madsen, as well as starring Jacqueline Bissett and Cliff Robertson. McCarthy portrays a new student at a prep school where he becomes roommates with Rob Lowe. Lowe goes and helps McCarthy get a girl. There, he meets an older woman played by Bissett and has an affair with her. After discovering his age, she breaks up with him. And more complications abound when McCarthy stays with Flo and his family during Christmas break and surprise, surprise, the older woman is Flo's mother. Released on July 6, 1983, reviews didn't think class had class. But the movie did okay in theaters, making $21 million. Ryan kept churning out the comedy throughout the summer with the Woody Allen movie z -Link. A mockumentary film with Alan playing the title character, something of a human chameleon, a man who looks and acts like the people who meets throughout the 20s and the 30s. Also starring Mia Farrow as Woody's love interest. Also being another film released by Warner Brothers after Ryan went out on his own, Zealand came out on July 15, 1983. The film grossed $11 million, but is widely regarded as one of Woody Allen's best works. Orion kept up the summer 1983 with one more comedy with Rodney Dangerfield in Easy Money. Dangerfield is Monty Capoletti, a bit of a hard living man, gambling, drinking, smoking pot, much to the ire of his mother-in-law. After she passes away, his family will get a $10 million inheritance, but only under one condition, if Monty can change his ways. Stop with the hard living for a year and get healthier. Also has a notable cast including Joe Pesci as Monty's friend, Geraldine Fitzgerald as the mother-in-law, Kenny Azara as Monty's wife, and Jennifer Jason Lee as his daughter. Easy Money came out on August 19, 1983, and while the critical response was middling, the lure of Rodney Dangerfield made Easy Money, making $29 million. Ryan's other input throughout the rest of 1983 included Strange Invaders, a sci-fi about a man who gets harassed by aliens. But no one believes him. Under Fire, about a love triangle during the Nicaraguan Revolution that ended the Somoza regime in 1979 in Nicaragua, with Nick Dolte, Gene Hackman, and Joanna Cassidy. Amityville 3D, another installment of the Amityville horror franchise in 3D. They would end the year with Gordy Park, about a Moscow cop investigating some homicides and gets involved with a political conspiracy. Starring William Hurt and Lee Marvin. While a few of those flicks were well received with critics, none of these were particularly successful with moviegoers. While 1983 was nothing to complain about, Ryan still had yet to climb the top. They needed to step up in 1984. Sadly, it didn't look like 1984 would be their year as Orion released more movies that didn't exactly offer the goods. Such films included Scandalous, a British mystery comedy involving an investigator going to London on an espionage case. Broadway Danny Rose, another Woody Allen film about a talent manager who tries to help out a lounge singer that gets caught up in a messy love triangle with gangsters. The movie broke even, but is critically considered another one of Woody Allen's best movies. Harry and Son, a family drama directed by and starring Paul Newman as a widow construction worker who can't do his job anymore and has a strained relationship with his children. The Hotel New Hampshire, based on John Irving's novel starring Jodie Foster, Bo Bridges, Rob Lowe, and a 10-year-old Seth Green. Up the Creek, a college comedy with Tim Matheson. The Bounty, the historical drama about the HMS Bounty with Mel Gibson and Anthony Hopkins. Beach Street, a film centering around the 80s hip-hop culture in New York. A Breed Apart, an actioner about the preservation of the bald eagle. Kathleen Turner, Rutger Hauer, and Powers Booth star. Cheech and Chong's The Corsican Brothers, with the famous comedy duo taking their own spin on the classic Alexandre Dumas novel. Heartbreakers, a movie about two men stuck in the 1960s and their exploits to find relationships. While these films broke even at best and flopped hard at worst, Orion did manage to get red hot in 1984.
And by red hot, we mean the woman in red. The title character was played by Kelly LeBrock in her first film role. The scene where a vent blows up her skirt drew illusions to Marilyn Monroe. The woman in red centers around Gene Wilder as a happily married man who gets smitten with the woman in red and wants to have an affair with her. A remake of the 1976 French film Pardon Mon Affair. The woman in red has a cast that also includes Charles Grogan, Gilda Radner, Joseph Bologna, and Judith Ivey. It is also renowned for the Stevie Wonder song, I Just Called to Say I Love You, which won an Oscar for Best Song and was the number one song on the Billboard's chart for three weeks in 1984. The Woman in Red came out on August 15, 1984, and while critics were not too impressed with the movie, it proved to be profitable, making $25 million. While adding another winning comedy to their repertoire, Orion looked for more critical and academy accolades with their next film. Saul Zenz, the legendary film producer who, years earlier, backed the Best Picture winner One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest in the 1978 film version of The Lord of the Rings, was brought aboard for the historical drama Amadeus, bringing in his muse Miles Foreman to direct, who also helmed One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Amadeus is based on a 1979 stage play by Peter Schaefer, who also written the screenplay. Amadeus centers around F. Murray Abraham as Antonio Salieri, the Italian composer who was pushed to the brink of insanity as he felt he was a very talented music composer fit to do the work of God, but instead is taken out of the limelight thanks to another composer. One Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, played by Tom Holtz. Salieri considers himself to be a man of class, as he feels that Mozart is so vulgar and crass and is disgusted over the fact that Mozart became so famed as he did. One of the finalists for the role of Mozart was Irish actor Kenneth Branagh, but would be turned down when it is decided to make the film with an American cast, which included Elizabeth Berridge as Mozart's wife Constance, and Jeffrey Jones as Joseph II, Holy Roman Emperor. Amadeus was released in theaters on September 19, 1984 to critical and commercial success, making $56 million on an $18 million budget. He would be nominated for several awards, including 11 noms for the Academy Awards, winning 8 including Best Picture, Best Director, Best Adapted Screenplay, and Best Actor for F. Murray Abraham. Orion has swam through some pretty rough waters to become a major, and while not exactly at the top, at least they had an Oscar winner to call their own. For the next film, Orion promised a young filmmaker that they would go forward with a movie idea of his if he agreed to get someone to finance the movie. And so he set out. Meanwhile, at Hemdale headquarters, John Daly was sitting in his office, going about his business, when he suddenly heard a scream from his receptionist. Wondering what was going on, Daly got scared when a man kicked down the door to his office, a bit on the intimidating side, wearing knee-high boots and a leather jacket. He had a gold foil covering his teeth and fake cuts on his forehead. He approached the timid movie executive and took a seat at his desk and just stared at him for a good 15 minutes. But to Daly, it probably felt like an eternity. Afterwards, a young man came inside to talk to Daly. That man was James Cameron, an ambitious filmmaker about to pitch his movie about a killer cyborg sent to the future. The man who had scared the ever-loving crap out of Daly was Lance Hendrickson. When Cameron wanted to play the cyborg and then went off to pitch his idea and show sketches of Lance as the Terminator. While most of us would call security, Daly didn't have security, but luckily he liked the pitch from James Cameron and thus the Terminator was born. Having a six million dollar budget, Cameron got right to work. For the heroic role of Kyle Reese, the studio wanted an actor with overseas appeal and sent the script to Arnold Schwarzenegger the Austrian bodybuilder who was beginning to forge his film career after starring in the hit Conan the Barbarian. Concerned that he would need a big guy to play opposite Arnold, several actors were considered, including Randy Quaid, Mel Gibson, Chevy Chase, and O.J. Simpson, which Cameron bought that, thinking a nice guy like O.J. Simpson would be believable as a killer. Uh -huh. Yes, I know. Hold your laughter. Regardless, Cameron agreed to meet with Schwarzenegger and even had devised a plan to pick a fight with them and will report to the studio that he is not for the role. But when the meeting came, Cameron was entertained by Schwarzenegger, who, instead of Kyle Reese, wanted to play the Terminator. Cameron liked his ideas and even sketched Arnold as a cyborg. 
Liking what he saw, Arnold Schwarzenegger would be cast as the Terminator. Though as for Lance Hendrickson, he wouldn't be left in the dust and he would be cast in a smaller role as part of a duo of police officers opposite Paul Winfield. Hendrickson would get to play a robot in James Cameron's Aliens, released two years later as an android bishop. O.J. Simpson would prove he's not such a nice guy ten years later. And even Randy Quaid would play a robot in Pluto Nash. Don't, 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 don't. For the role of Kyle Reese, the musician Sting was considered before Michael Bean would be cast. Bean, however, almost blew his chance for the role. During his first audition, Bean had spoken with a southern accent, which had stuck with him due to him acting in the theater production of Cat in the Hot Tin Roof. Fortunately, he will be given a second chance, and was signed on as a protector of Sarah Connor. For Sarah Connor herself, several actresses were considered, including Bridget Fonda, Rosanna Arquette, and Deborah Winger, before Linda Hamilton would be cast in a role. The special effects will be done by SFX guru Stan Winston. Some more ideas were suggested by higher-ups, including a cyborg dog, a companion for Reese, which Cameron thankfully rejected. However, he did agree to add more of a romantic subplot between Reese and Sarah. And one idea that John Daly wanted was for the movie to end at the point where the Terminator gets blown up inside the truck during the climactic chase and not continue on with the climax in the factory. Cameron and Daly would clash over it, and eventually the climax was kept. Meanwhile, Ryan did not screen the film for critics, fearing they had a flop on their hands, but the worries would be unfound. Terminator was released on October 26, 1984 and became a hit with critics and audiences, ranking in $78 million. With the success of the movie, Schwarzenegger became even more of a star, and filmmaker James Cameron would be put on the map, going on to make other hits, like Aliens and The Abyss, and in 1991, Cameron Schwarzenegger and Lemon Hamilton would team up again to do Terminator 2 Judgment Day, becoming the highest grossing movie that year and helping the original Terminator to find more of an audience. Three more Terminator sequels would come out over the years with varying degrees of quality, but would not touch the first two Terminator films. With a bit of a winning streak, Ryan ended the year with the Cotton Club, a story about the happenings of a jazz club in 1930s Harlem. Headline in the cast was Richard Gere, Gregory Hines, Diane Lane, Lynette McKee, Bob Hoskins, James Omar, and Nicolas Cage. The script was based on a story by Mario Puzo, alongside Robert Evans with producing duties and Francis Ford Coppola directing the feature. Together, the Evans-Coppola duo has resulted in the Godfather films. Coppola had directed Apocalypse Now, which was a hit, but was in a bit of a career slump after the flop won from the heart and hoped the Cotton Club would bring him back on top. Unfortunately for Coppola, his movies would have a bad history of troubled productions and the Cotton Club was no exception. Robert Evans got the idea for the movie in the early 80s after looking at a picture history book of the club. However, he would struggle to find backers to the film. The New York vaudeville show promoted Roy Radin, who Evans met through the Miami drug dealer Laney Jacobs. However, Jacobs wanted a share of the profits and a production credit, but Radin refused, and shortly after, he would be found dead. Shot up pretty badly. Jacobs would be charged with his murder and would end up in prison on a life sentence, no parole. While Evans was never proven to be involved with Raiden's death, it nevertheless complicated the production big time. Evans would bring back his old partner Coppola and help work on the script problems as well as direct it. Coppola accepted. However, in the past, the two big Hollywood players clashed. First during The Godfather and now in The Cotton Club. From script changes to crew changes to distribution rights of Evans wanting to go to Paramount with access to studio facilities and funding. But Coppola opted for Orion, a company focusing strictly on marketing and distribution. Coppola won out, leaving Evans the burden of funding different sources of funds. After filming rep, the woes were not over as lawsuits resulted. Evans sued Coppola, the Dumani brothers, Las Vegas brothers and casino owners, who helped finance the film, and Orion, and resulted in Evans getting a flat fee, but yielding creative control to Coppola. Later on, another investor, Victor L. Saia, sued the Domanis, Evans, and Orion for fraud and breach of contract. 
investing $5 million, Saya felt he wouldn't recoup his money due to the budget inflating from $25 million to $58 million. Saya accused the Dumanis of forcing out Evans and an Orion loan of $15 million unnecessarily inflated the budget. After that, Evans sued Edward Dumani to keep from acting as a general partner of the film. The murder of a film investor, a clash of egos, and several lawsuits left the cloud looming over the Cotton Club when it was released on December 14, 1984. The reviews weren't too great, though Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert called this the best film in 1984. Nevertheless, the Cotton Club bombed, making $25 million. While Francis Ford Coppola kept on directing, his career would never reach the heights of his 70s peak. After a nice winning streak to end it on a shaky note, Orion looked to rebound in 1985. Some of their most notorious films that year included The Falcon and the Snowman, the Hemdell produced spy movie centering around the real events of two men, Christopher Boyce and Andrew Dalton Lee, who sold American secrets to the Soviet Union. The two would be played by Timothy Hutton and Sean Penn respectively. The movie would be directed by John Schlesinger, who had success with Midnight Cowboy and Marathon Man. The film was released on January 25, 1985, receiving good reviews and making $17 million on a $7 million budget, making Falcon and the Snowman a modest success. Woody Allen returns to the directing chair once again for The Purple Rose of Cairo, a Depression-era fantasy film with Mia Farrow as a moviegoer with a broken home life, who goes out and watches another flick where one of the movie characters, played by Jeff Daniels, comes out of the movie and the two develop a relationship. While Woody Allen's films with Orion were so far never great winners at the box office, this one making $10 million on a $15 million budget, they were always popular with his fans and critics. And The Purple Rose of Cairo will be another beloved film for Allen. Madonna, one of the hottest pop stars in 1985, stars in her first major film role, Desperately Sinking Susan, with Rosanna Arquette. The comedy drama centers around Arquette as Roberta, a bored housewife who starts reading the classifieds for fun, but she reads about Susan, played by Madonna, who is a mysterious woman who intrigues Roberta, and sets off to see Susan, who turns out to be wanted by the mob. When Roberta attempts to emulate Susan, she gets caught up in the mess. Originally, Diane Keaton and Goldie Hawn were intended to star in the movie as Roberta and Susan respectively, but then the studio decided to cast younger actresses to attract more of an audience. While Madonna was a hot commodity with songs such as Like a Virgin, she was still untested as a film actor, only having a bit role in Warner Brothers' coming-of-age film, Vision Quest. The gamble would pay off. Desperately Sick and Susan was released on March 29, 1985, being well-received by critics and was a box office hit, bringing in $27 million on a film's $4.5 million budget. The movie would later spawn off a Broadway play, going to action route again. Ryan brings along Chuck Norris in Code of Silence. Norris is Eddie Cusack, a police officer fighting drug lords after a drug bust gone bad. But none of the cops want to help him because he testified against a cop who shot an unarmed teenager. Thus, breaking the Code of Silence. But he's not alone. He gets to work with a police robot named Prowler. The actioner will be directed by Andrew Davis, who later on would take the helm behind such successful movies such as Above the Law, under Siege, and The Fugitive, where he would get an Oscar nomination. Code of Silence came out on May 3, 1985 to mix to positive reception, being one of Chuck Norris's best films to date. The movie would be successful, bringing in $20 million. Dan O'Bannon, who penned such films as Alien and Cobra Blue Thunder, took the director's chair for the first time in the horror comedy Return of the Living Dead. Centering around two men working at a medical supply warehouse who accidentally release a vapor into the city, bringing the deceased back to life as, you guessed it, zombies. The movie will be noticeable for introducing the concept that zombies ate brains rather than human flesh. Released on August 16, 1985, Return of the Dead got good reviews and was a modest hit, earning $14 million on a $4 million budget. The movie was spawned for sequels. Back in the 1960s, when the heads of Orion were at UA, they released Dr. No, a movie featuring the British spy James Bond, based on Ian Fleming's series of books. The film would be quite successful, in the film franchise still up and running to this day. 
Having great success there, the powers that be at Orion thought they could repeat the formula when they released the American equivalent of James Bond, Remo Williams, in his first movie, Remo Williams' The Adventure Begins. Based on the Destroyer series of novels, Fred Ward plays the title character about a cop recruited by a secret government organization and showcases training to become a master assassin. Guy Hamilton would be brought on to direct, who had a Bond pedigree with Goldfinger, Diamonds Are Forever, Live and Let Die, and The Man with the Golden Gun under his belt. Another Bond contributor would be screenwriter Christopher Wood, who penned The Spy Who Loved Me and Moonraker. Banking hard for a new movie franchise for Orion, Remo Williams' The Adventure Begins was released on October 11, 1985 to mixed reviews and flopped at theaters, making $14 million. Alas, the adventure would end for Remo Williams. A few years later, a TV pilot would be commissioned, but would not be picked up as a series. Remo Williams would be a part of another overall unsuccessful year with Orion, who struggled with the marketing of its films. Among the other releases of 1985 including the Kurt Russell thriller The Mean Season, The Bay Boy, The Great Depression Story with Keith Sutherland in his film debut, Secret Admirer, The Romantic Comedy with C. Thomas Howell, The Guardian Angel Comedy The Heavenly Kid, Flesh and Blood, a medieval epic directed by Dutch director Paul Verhoeven, who will shortly thereafter direct one of Orion's big hits, Fear, a film satirizing television advertising. David Allen Greer would be one of the main roles, just a few years away from In Living Color. Maxi with Glenn Close, based on a 1973 novel Marion's Wall by Jack Finney. The first month of 1986 began with mixed blessings, with the long shots, the Tim Conway Harvey Corman comedy, Bombing Hard, FX, a thriller about a Hollywood sound effects man being hired by the government to help someone fake his death before he goes under witness protection with Brian Dennehy, which was a modest hit. And the Woody Allen film Hannah and Her Sisters with Woody, Mia Farrow, Carrie Fisher, and Michael Caine about the exploits of, well, Hannah and Her Sisters. The film would be a big hit and would be nominated for several Oscars, winning Best Supporting Actor and Best Supporting Actress for Michael Caine and Diane West, respectively. Around this time, though, Ian Warburg Pincus and company one of the company's original investors, started getting impatient with Orion. The company put a 20% stake and felt like they were not getting anything in return. Orion set off to find more investors. One of the potential suitors were Mario Kassar and Andrew G. Vajna of Kuroko, attempted to buy $55 million worth of stock. Had they done so, they would have controlled the board and fired every executive, save for Krim. However, Warburg Pincus sold 50% of the stock to Viacom International. That would come as a relief to Orion, with their executives being able to keep their positions. Throughout the spring of 86, they released a few more duds with Just Between Friends with Mary Tyler Moore, being produced under her company MTM. At Close Range, a historical crime drama with Sean Penn and Christopher Walken, and Absolute Beginners, a rock musical based on Colin McInnes' novel. Despite this, Orion will find another investor. On May 22, 1986, the television and communications company Metro Media, ran by billionaire and one of Krim's friends, John Kluge, bought a 6.5 stake in Orion. Although the studio was appearing to be an also-ran, fortunately, the luck of Orion was about to change and soar to the astronomical heights fitting for its name. For the summer of 1986, Ryan will once again bring back Rodney Dangerfield for the comedy Back to School. Rodney will once again take the role of the obnoxious but lovable brute. This time, playing a wealthy business owner who enrolls in the college to help out his son. Also including in the cast are Sally Kellerman as a teacher who helps him and eventually becomes his love interest. Keith Gordon as his son, Burt Young as Rodney's bodyguard, Robert Downey Jr. as an ultra-liberal student who thinks football is fascist, and Sam Kinison doing his screaming shtick as a Vietnam vet turned history teacher and a cameo by author Kurt Vonnegut. The majority of the movie was filmed at the University of Wisconsin. Back to School would hit theaters on June 13, 1986 and was well received by critics. On the film's $11 million budget, Back to School made $91 million making it a runaway success as well as one of the highest grossing films of 1986. 
Despite the major success of Back to School, Ryan went through more motions, including Miracles, a comedy about a divorced couple who can't seem to keep away from each other. Haunted Honeymoon with Gene Wilder and Gilda Radner, the action film Opposing Force, the British comedy Foreign Body and Something Wild, a comedy with Melanie Griffith and Jeff Bridges about a woman who takes a man on a crazy adventure. While not a hit in theaters, it would find an audience on video. At the end of the year, however, Ryan would hit a bit of a stride, starting with Who's Years, a coming-of-age drama centering around Gene Hackman as Norman Dale, a former college basketball coach, who takes the reign of a high school basketball team in 1950s Indiana to take them to the top. The movie itself is based on the Milan high school basketball team who won the championship in 1954. Cast also includes Barbara Hershey as Myra Fleener, one of the faculty members who looks after one of the star players that Dale is trying to bring up to par, and Dennis Hopper as Shooter Flatch, an alcoholic and father of one of the players. Hopper would be nominated for an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor for the role. Released on November 14, 1986, critics praise Hoosiers, as well as audiences, earning $28.6 million on a film's $6 million budget. To end 1986, Ryan released two movies in the final month of the year. The first film would be Three Amigos, a comedy film directed by Animal House and the Blues Brothers filmmaker John Landis. Playing the titular Three Amigos would be Steve Martin, Chevy Chase, and Martin Short, a trio of actors in the silent era of Hollywood who are big stars in a series of adventure films that get invited to Mexico. Thinking they were going to make a movie, they would be surprised when the Mexican villagers asked him to stop the villainous El Gupto, who has been terrorizing the village. Released on December 12, 1986, critics were divided about the Three Amigos, but the movie made $39 million on a $25 million budget, making it a slight hit. While adding another successful comedy under their belt, Orion once again craved more academic merits and hoped their next film would do just that. The last film that year, released a week after The Three Amigos, was Platoon, directed by the up-and-coming Oliver Stone, who also wrote the script, which was based on his experiences during the Vietnam War when he served. The story centers around a young soldier named Chris Taylor, played by Charlie Sheen, who had dropped out of college and joined the army, where he got shipped off to Vietnam. Along with facing the dangers and horrors of war, conflict centers around Tom Berenger as Sergeant Barnes, who has no qualms torturing innocent villagers and would pit against Willem Dafoe's Sergeant Elias, a more kind-hearted leader. The cast will also feature Kevin Dillon, John C. McGinley, Keith David, Forrest Whitaker, Tony Todd, and Johnny Depp. This will be another Hamdell production for Orion, and one of the two films Oliver Stone made for Hamdell, the other being Salvador, featuring James Woods as an American journalist who gets caught up in the conflict of the Salvadorian Civil War. Salvador would not be successful at the box office, but was critically lauded and a nice start for Stallone, who was concentrating more on Platoon. To prepare the actors for their roles, Stone had them take an intense two-week training course, which saw them dig foxholes as well as stage ambushes with the explosive and soldiers. This training will help them get in the mood for the movie, to get inside their heads, tire them out, having them not give a damn, the feelings when death approaches. The movie will be filmed in the Philippines. Platoon came out in theaters on December 19, 1986 to good reviews, and audiences flocked to see the war movie. On the film's small $6 million budget, it made $138.5 million, making Platoon a runaway success. Not only that, come Oscar time, the war flick would receive several nominations and win four for Best Sound, Best Editing, Best Director, and Best Picture. It would also be a winner at the Golden Globes, for the Best Drama Film, Best Screenplay, Best Director, and Best Supporting Actor for Tom Berenger. The investment by Metro Media had certainly come at the right time. A good 1986 with a few good hits and another Oscar winner for Orion, which could, by this point, be seriously considered as a major. To begin 1987, Orion put out Radio Days, another Woody Allen picture. Alongside writing and directing duties, Woody is the narrator Joe, talking about the exploits of his family during their golden age of radio, starring Seth Green in an early childhood role as a young Joe, as well as Diane West as Joe's aunt, as well as Woody Allen regular Mia Farrell as a DJ, and a cast that includes Diane Keaton, 
Jeff Daniels, and David A. Yellow. Radio Days came out on January 30, 1987, and like a lot of Woody's films, wasn't a particularly strong performer in the theaters, just making $60 million on a film's $14.8 million budget. But once again, critics and Allen's fans were pleased. It would be nominated for an Oscar for Best Original Screenplay. Throughout early 1987, Ryan went through more motions with Making Mr. Right, a sci-fi romantic comedy with John Malkovich and Anne Magnuson, and Malone, a thriller with Burt Reynolds, who at this point was going through a career slump, and Malone just added to it. Despite a so-so start, Ryan looked to the summer to bring the goods. They began with the June 10, 1987 release of The Believers, a religious horror based on the Nicholas Condy novel, The Religion. Directed by Midnight Cowboys John Schlesinger and starring Martin Sheen as Cal Jamison, a New York police psychologist investigating a series of murdered children by a religious cult. The stakes get tenser when the cult targets Cal's son. Also in the cast is Robert Loja and Helen Shaver. The Believers was panned by critics, dismissing it as a ripoff of Rosemary's Baby and The Exorcist. But it made a small profit, making $18 million but would be small time compared to their next picture. So far, 1987 wasn't exactly panning out to be a big year for Ryan, releasing films that haven't really blown people away. And then Robocop came. This sci-fi action flick would be directed by Dutch director Paul Verhoeven, who had some success in his native Netherlands with the 1973 movie Turkish Delight, and Robocop being his second film in America, the first being Orion's flesh and blood two years earlier. Set in a futuristic Detroit, now bankrupt and crime-ridden, well, just like Detroit today, police officer Alex Murphy, played by Peter Weller, pursues a dangerous gang in a warehouse. <laughs> and it doesn't work out well. Well, give the man a hand! <laughs> However, with the help of the mega corporation OCP, he will get a more cybernetic body and be revived as Robocop. As the newly Christian Robocop, he takes on the bad guys. Also included in the cast is Nancy Allen as Robocop's partner Officer Ann Lewis, Ronnie Cox as the corrupt OCP senior president Dick Jones, Kurtwood Smith as Clarence Bodicker, the leader of the gang that killed Murphy, Miguel Ferrer as Bob Morton, an OCP executive that would often clash with Dick Jones, and Dan O'Harely as the OCP chairman, the old man. For the role of Robocop, Rutger Hauer and Arnold Schwarzenegger were among the candidates considered for the role, but after they proved to be too big for the Robocop set, they had to go for a smaller man and came in Peter Weller. Not only that, but Weller would show the proper emotion while wearing the helmet, which only shows his mouth. The suit would be problematic while filming. Not only did Weller suffer due to it being hard to move in and filming in the summer where it got hot, it also proved hard to light for the filmmakers. Eventually, they got the idea to light it like a car. The movie would be filmed around Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and the Houston, Dallas, Texas area. The film would be made on a $13 million budget. Robocop came to theaters on July 17, 1987. The reviews were positive, praising the action, the satire, and social comedy and is regarded as one of the better films of 1987. It was also a huge hit, bringing in $53.4 million and launching a franchise that would spawn a few TV series, two of them being animated, and a couple of sequels, which will be discussed later. And a remake. Ryan looked to get a winning streak going with the thriller No Way Out, a remake of the 1948 Paramount Pictures film The Big Clock which was based on the Kenneth Fearing novel of the same name. Kevin Costner is U.S. Navy Lieutenant Commander Tom Farrell, who happens to have an affair with Sean Young Susan Atwell, but would be part of a bad love triangle as she's also seeing Farrell's superior, Secretary of Defense, David Bryce, played by Gene Hackman. After Susan ends up dead and the suspicion that a KGB mole is involved, it's up to Farrell to find out who's responsible. This was the second film Kevin Costner was starring that summer, with the first being The Untouchables, where he played Elliot Ness and fought Robert De Niro's Al Capone during the Prohibition era, which was a big hit in making Costner a rising star. 
That star will rise higher when No Way Out came out on August 14, 1987 to positive reviews and on the film's $15 million budget earned $35 million, making it a nice one-two punch for Orion. A good summer, however, will be followed by more underperformers. Such examples such as the man Evil Adventure Lionheart, not to be confused with the John claude Van Damme film, the Columbian Adventure Hotel Colonial, Bestseller, a neo-noir film with James Woods and Brian Dennehy, which didn't live up to his name. House of Games, a psychiatrist who tried to help a compulsive gambler who gets caught up in the world common. David Mamet's directorial debut. No Man's Land, a crime film with Charlie Sheen and was written by Dick Wolf. Yes, that Dick Wolf. The title of the movie was like the theaters when it was playing it. September, a film about a dysfunctional family directed by Woody Allen. While none of his films really made the big bucks, September didn't even crack the one million dollar mark. However, Orion would end 1987 on a high note with the Danny DeVito, Billy Crystal comedy, Throw Mama from the Train. Being a directorial debut of Danny DeVito, DeVito will also play Owen, a student at Larry's writing class. Larry is portrayed by Billy Crystal. Both men have problems. Owen has a horrible mother and wants her dead. Larry has an ex-wife who is stealing his writing and claiming it under her name becoming rich off of it. In a little deal, Owen volunteers to kill his ex-wife in exchange for Larry to kill his mother. Larry takes it as a joke until Owen manages to knock her off, and things get crazy from there. Film critics will be mixed, though they did praise the chemistry between DeVito and Crystal, but Throw Mama from the Train would be a hit with audiences, and when it came to theaters on December 11, 1987, it earned $57 million on the film's $14 million budget, making it a solid hit for Orion to end the year on. Around this time, Orion will finally branch out into the home entertainment market. For years, HBO and Vestron will release their films on video, but now Orion will take up the slack, forming the Orion home video label. Starting their own video company was another indication that Orion was one of the major players in the movie business. To begin 1988, Orion put out the comedy film The Couch Trip, starring Dan Aykroyd, Donna Dixon, Walter Matthau, and Charles Grodin. In The Couch Trip, Aykroyd is a former computer hacker who escapes from a mental ward and impersonates a radio host on a psychiatrics radio show where he becomes a big hit. Sadly, the same couldn't be said about the movie. Despite mixed reviews, it just brought in $11 million, short of the film's $19 million budget. Hoping for another hit and another taste at more critical merit, they brought back Saul Sense, to produce the bearable lightness of being with Philip Kotman directing. Based on the novel by Milan Kundera, the movie takes place during the 1968 Prague Spring. The film centers around a love triangle between Daniel Day Lewis Thomas, Julia Binoche Teresa, and Lena Olin Sabrina. While the critics would heap praise on it, it fell short of the movie's $17 million budget, making $10 million. They would go through more flops early that year with the sci-fi Cherry 2000 with Melanie Griffith, a film whose release was delayed for two years. The 60s period piece The In Crowd, another period piece with the 50s thriller The House on Carroll Street, and Dominic and Eugene, a drama about twin brothers played by Tom Hulse and Ray Liotta. They even tried to save Anthony Michael Hall's floundering career with Johnny B. Good a sports comedy also starring Uma Thurman and Robert Downey Jr. Hall is a high school quarterback who is being recruited for college and needs to decide to stay in the state where he can get a good education and stay with his girlfriend or the most prestigious colleges who, who throw at him the girls, the cash, and the cars. Anthony Michael Hall was one of the members of the Brat Pack, a group of young actors who starred in some of the biggest films in the 1980s. Hall had starred as the nerd in 16 Candles and The Breakfast Club to great success. He would try branching out, appearing in a season of Saturday Night Live in such a weird cast which included Joan Collins, Robert Downey Jr., Randy Quay, John Lovitz, and Dennis Miller. Unfortunately, that year was poorly received due to the cast's lack in chemistry, and all but three of the cast members would be let go, including Hall. Afterwards, he starred in the thriller Out of Bounds, which also flopped. Hall, like his fellow Brad Packers, was struggling to keep relevant and he had hoped Johnny B. Good would keep his leading man career going. Unfortunately, Johnny B. Bad, both with critics and audiences, 
the Revere's tore it to shreds like Baraka in Mortal Kombat. It made $17 million, just shy of the movie's $22 million budget. After that failure, Orion went to more serious flair with Colors, a crime film directed by Dennis Hopper, who also found success with Easy Rider 19 years ago. LAPD senior cop Bob Hodges, played by Robert Duvall, joins forces with Sean Penn's rookie cop Danny Pac-Man McGavin as they battle the gangs of Los Angeles, the Bloods, the Crips, and the Hispanic gangs. During production, Sean Penn, who was something of a bad boy at the time, punched out an extra who was taking pictures of him without his permission during production and served 33 days in jail. Fortunately, this controversy didn't hurt Colors. Released on April 15, 1988, Colors was a hit with audiences and critics, making almost five times his $10 million budget, bringing in $46 million, a nice hit to break out the rocky start Orion had so far in 1988. Meanwhile, at the Orion headquarters, the control of the studio was a waging war between Collusion Metro Media versus Summer Redstone and National Amusements. The feud dated back to January 1987, with Redstone buying a bit of a stock in the company. Meanwhile, Redstone bought Viacom and kept increasing his stock in the company. It went back and forth as Redstone and Cluj kept buying all interest in Orion. It all came to the end in May 1988 when Cluj bought 67% of Orion, pretty much giving him complete control of the studio. After the stock wars, Orion concentrated on the summer and started off with Bull Durham, a baseball romantic comedy based on experiences of writer slash director Ron Shelton. Headline is Kevin Costner as Crash Davis, a veteran catcher at the minor league Durham Bulls in Durham, North Carolina. He is assigned to help Tim Robbins as Nuke Lelouch, the young pitcher who just joined the team. Things get hairy, however, when Susan Sarandon's Annie Savoy, who has an affair with Nuke, but finds herself attracted to Crash. Bull Durham proved to be a hard sell, as no Hollywood executive saw the commercial appeal of a baseball movie, but luckily Orion gave them a chance, with giving him a $9 million budget and creative control. Kevin Costner would be cast due to his athletic ability, even hitting two home runs while the cameras were rolling. The comedy came out on June 15, 1988, to critical audience acclaim, bringing in $50.9 million. Also of note, Tim Robbins and Susan Sarandon met on the set and soon had a relationship that saw them have two children. They were split up in 2009. They would attempt at a family comedy with Mac and Me, sitting around a little boy who befriends an alien and helps him find his family. Gee, why does that sound familiar? <laughs> Oh yeah! Way to rip off a popular movie, Orion! Anyway, this film is known for its product placement which showcases Coca-Cola, Sears, Skittles, which the alien eats, and McDonald's, which even goes so far to have Robert McDonald in the cast! Hi kids! It's me, Ronald McDonald, and I'm on the set of my very first motion picture ever! It's a movie called Mac and Me, and it stars my little friend from outer space here. His name is Mac, and I want to introduce you to him. Mac? Anybody seen Mac? Where'd he go? Aging Ronald McDonald. Well, listen, I've got to go now. You're wanted in makeup. And yet, they were so sure that this movie would succeed, he even had an in credit notice saying, We'll be back. <laughs> no. No, they would not. Critics trashed the film for obvious reasons, and the film only made $6.4 million after being released on August 12, 1988. A couple of weeks later, on September 2nd, Ryan put out another baseball-related film, this time with more dramatic flair, in Eight Men Now. The movie is based on Elia Asinoff's 1963 book, Eight Men Out, The Black Sox, and the 1919 World Series, centering around the real-life events that happened during the 1919 World Series where the Chicago White Sox lost to the Cincinnati Reds and eight of the White Sox players were accused of intentionally losing just to win money from gambling. While they would be acquitted, they would be banned from baseball from life. The film has a cast that includes John Cusack, Clifton James, Michael Lerner, Christopher Lloyd, Charlie Sheen, David Strathern, and D.B. Sweeney. Despite being well received, he may not underperform making $5.7 million on a budget of $6.6 .6 million. Throughout the rest of the summer and going to the fall of 1988, 
The other Orion pictures include Monkey Shines by horror guru George A. Romero, centering around a quadriplegic man whose trained monkey helper turns against him. Without a clue, a Sherlock Holmes comedy with Michael Caine and Ben Kingsley. Another Woman, a dramatic film from Woody Allen centering around a woman who is drawn to a pregnant woman seeking help from a psychiatrist. While having a few ups, 1988 wasn't too special for Orion, but did end the year during the holidays with a nice one-two punch. December 9, 1988 brought out Mississippi Burning, a historical crime thriller directed by Alan Parker, the British director of Midnight Express, and Pink Floyd The Wall. The movie stars Gene Hackman and Willem Dafoe, two FBI agents who investigate the disappearances of civil rights activists in 1964 Mississippi. The movie itself was loosely based on the real-life murders of three civil rights activists in 1964 Mississippi. The movie opened to good reviews from critics and did reasonably well, earning $34.6 million. Mississippi Burning would earn several Oscar nominations, winning one for Best Cinematography, but it will be one of the films considered for Best Picture in 1988, but it would lose to Rain Man. A few days later, on December 14th, their last film of the year will be released, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, the comedy starring Steve Martin and Michael Caine and directed by Frank Oz, best known for being a puppeteer for Miss Piggy and Yoda, as well as becoming something of an upcoming director, having helmed Little Shop of Horrors. In the movie, Martin and Caine play two rival con men who make a bet to see who can swindle a young American woman out of $50,000. The movie was originally intended to star Mick Jagger and David Bowie, with Eddie Murphy considered for a role before they went for Martin and Kane. Dirty Rotten Scoundrels was positively reviewed by critics and made a profit, earning $42 million. 1989 came around, and Orion began the year with Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. The comedy has Keanu Reeves and Alex Winter play the title roles as two dim-witted high school students who travel through time to see historical figures to help them with their history reports. The cast also includes stand-up comic George Carlin as Rufus, who helps Bill and Ted through their quest. Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure came out on February 17, 1989 with reviews being mixed to good. But Bill and Ted was a hit, making $40 million on a movie's budget of $10 million. It would even spawn an animated series the following year with Reeves, Winter, and Carlin reprising their roles. Bill and Ted was a good enough beginning for Orion, but unfortunately, what followed would hurt Orion bad. After Bill and Ted came a series of flops, which included Farewell to the King, a World War II film with Nick Nolte, the racing comedy Speed Zone, Los Angels, an independent film with Don Sutherland, and the BC Boys Adam Horvitz, and Great Balls of Fire, the biopic of musician Jerry Lee Lewis, played by Dennis Quaid. With those strings of flops hurting them, Orion needed to put out a strong product to stop the bleeding. They needed something. And for their next movie, they turned to an unlikely person, hoping he could be their savior. Weird Al Yankovic was one of the biggest music stars of the 1980s. Not in the vein of Michael Jackson or Madonna, no. He parried some of the hit songs of the time, making such silly ballads like I Love Rocky Road, Eat It, I Lost on Jeopardy, Rye of the Kaiser, and Like a Surgeon. Yankovic was one of the pioneers of the music industry with his comedy songs. Over the years, people approached him to star in a movie and eventually he agreed. Ryan gave him the star treatment and even had him on to do several movies with him, the first of which would be UHF. UHF centers around Yankovic as George Newman, a daydreaming loser who got the deed to a UHF TV station where he takes it over and brings to the air his own crazy ideas of TV shows and managed to be a big success. Also including the cast is David Bowie, Billy Barty, Michael Richards, Kevin McCarthy, and Victoria Jackson. The movie will be filmed around Tulsa, Oklahoma. After filming Raft, Ryan showed the movie to test audiences and liked it, making it one of the most successful screen testings in the studio's history. Being confident, Ryan was scheduled for release on July 21st, 1989 as a hopeful summer blockbuster. It would be a bold move indeed as the summer 1989 had quite the fierce competition with films that would include Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Ghostbusters 2, Honey I Shrunk the Kids, Lethal Weapon 2, Batman, License to Kill, When Harry Met Sally, and Weekend at Bernie's. 
for Ryan was certain it had a big hit on their hands. UHF came to theaters to mix reviews from critics, and any hopes of UHF can make a dent in the summer 1989 season proved to be unfounded as UHF barely made its budget back, making only $6.1 million on a budget of $5 million. Embarrassed at the poor showing, Ryan pulled it out of theaters. It would even put Will Allen Yankovic in a career slump for a few years until he recovered in 1992 with the album Off the Deep End, where he parodied the grunge group Nirvana with the song Smells Like Teen Spirit. While not the big blockbuster the failing studio was hoping for, UHF later on became a cult classic after video releases and TV airing. After their failure that summer, Ryan put out more films that include Rude Awakening, the hippie comedy with Cheech Baron and Eric Roberts, The Package, the America vs. Soviet thriller with Gene Hackman, Heart of Dixie, the struggles of three women in a college in 1957 Alabama with integration, Eric the Viking, the Viking comedy directed by Monty Python's Terry Jones with Tim Robbins in the title role, Crimes and Misdemeanors, another Woody Allen film, The Bilo's Foreman Helm Vaultman, Prancer, a Christmas movie about a little girl who takes care of an injured reindeer, who she thinks belongs to Santa, and She-Devil, a comedy with Meryl Streep and Roseanne Barr. While only very little of those films made a profit, none of them cracked the $20 million mark, and for 1989 as a whole, Ryan placed last in box office returns. The utter failure of a year dwindled the studio's pocket bad, not to mention killing the confidence of the studio's executives. February 1990 would lead to a couple of big events for Orion. That month, Mike Metaboy, one of the original founders, left the sinking studio to become the chairman of TriStar Pictures. Under Metaboy's reign, TriStar put out several successful films including Philadelphia, Terminator 2 Judgment Day, Sleepless in Seattle, Cliffhanger, The Fisher King, Legends of the Fall, and Hook. Soon after, he stepped down and in 1995, alongside Arnold Messer, would found Phoenix Pictures. Phoenix produced several notable films including The People vs. Larry Flint, The Thin Red Line, Urban Legends, Lake Placid, Zodiac, and Shutter Island. Around that same month, Orion agreed to a deal with Columbia Pictures Entertainment where Columbia would distribute Orion's films overseas. For this agreement, Orion would receive $175 billion. Meanwhile, in the movie front, they had a few films they hoped would put them on top. The comedy Madhouse had two of the biggest TV stars of the time. John Larroquette, who won four consecutive Emmys for his role as sex-crazed district attorney Dan Fielding on Night Court, and Kirstie Alley, known for her neurotic Rebecca Howe on Cheers. Larroquette and Alley play Mark and Jesse Bannister, a married couple whose house gets taken over by unwanted house guests, and things get hairier as more and more people show up. The movie came out on February 16, 1990 and made $21 million, but was destroyed by critics. The First Power, a neo-noir horror film, stars Lou Diamond Phillips as a cop who goes after a criminal who was executed and revived by the devil and once again goes on his killing spree. Released on April 6, 1990, The First Power was not well received by critics, but on the movie's $10 million budget, it pulled in $22 million, making it a profit. The comedy Cadillac Man featured Robin Williams as a slick car salesman with several problems. He owes money to his ex-wife, having affairs with two women, one of them married, owes money to the mafia, and is on a strict deadline where he has to sell six cars in two days or else he will lose his job. Things get more complicated when Tim Robbins as a crazed motorcyclist takes the car dealership hostage. This will be directed by Roger Donaldson, director of No Way Out back in 1987. Released on May 18, 1990, Cadillac Man was divided by critics, but it made money, $27 million on a $15 million budget. Those movies would be released on the first five months of 1990 and while profitable, did not lift up Orion who was quickly descending into a big financial hole. The other films released during those five months didn't help either. One movie starred Nick Nolte and Deborah Winger and was written by famed playwright Arthur Miller and it was called Everybody Wins. No they don't. The Last of the Finest, a cop movie with Brian Dennehy, Love at Large, a mystery with Tom Berenger, Miami Blues, a crime thriller with Alec Baldwin and Fred Ward. Those other films flopped and didn't even crack the $10 million mark. 
with them losing money fast, Ryan hoped December 1990 would bring good tidings, not the embarrassment that was UHF. With the closest thing they had to a franchise, they brought back Robocop in the sequel, Robocop 2. Peter Weller will once again don the Robocop suit as he fights crime, this time going after a drug lord who brings a deadly drug to the streets of Detroit. Adding further complication, OCP is interested in bringing out a new Robocop, one that will be more powerful than Murphy. The cast includes Nancy Allen from the first movie as his partner, Belinda Bauer, an OCP executive pushing for the new Robocop, Tom Noonan as the drug lord Kane, and Gabriel Damon as a kid criminal who partners with the drug lord. Paul Verhoeven would not direct this outing, instead taking the helm from Arnold Schwarzenegger's Total Recall, and instead bringing in Irvin Kirshner, best on directing Star Wars if Emperor Strikes Back. The screenplay will be written by famed comic book writer Frank Miller, along with Waylon Green, who made it a darker and grittier version of Robocop. Robocop 2 was released on June 22, 1990 to mixed reviews, with some disliking the darker direction the film series took. It also faced competition with Total Recall and Dick Tracy, but Robocop 2 held its own. On the film's $35 million budget, it made $45 million, making it a modest success. A little later, on July 20, 1990, the action movie Navy Seals was released. A group of Navy Seals battle a terrorist group who manages to get their hands on high-tech weaponry. The cast includes Charlie Sheen, Michael Bean, Dennis Haysbert, Bill Paxton, Joanne Whaley, and Rick Rosevic. It would be panned by reviewers and was not a big money maker, just earning a little over its $21 million budget at $25 million. It would, however, find more success on video. While summer 1990 for Orion wasn't too special, it would get worse going to autumn with more flops like the neo-noir State of Grace with Sean Penn, Ed Harris, and Gary Holman. The Hot Spot, another noir film directed by Dennis Hopper. And Alice, another Woody Allen film. With the debts mounting, Orion needed to act fast. They hoped their next film would do just that. In the 1980s, screenwriter Michael Blake wrote a film called Dances with Wolves about Lieutenant John J. Dunbar, a Civil War soldier who would befriend a tribe of Indians. He shopped around from studio to studio with no takers. Kevin Costner, who starred in the Blake Penn Stacy's Knights, urged Blake to turn his script into a novel to increase the chances of being made into a film. And he did just that. The book form of Dances with Wolves will be published in 1988 and became a number one bestseller. After the novel's success, Kevin Costner bought the rights to the film and with acting and producing duties, he also became the director, making his directorial debut in the movie. The move would not be an easy one for Costner, however, as his inexperience behind the camera caused some delays in what would prove to be quite the rocky production. Filming in South Dakota, in a state with unpredictable weather as well as actors struggling to learn their lines in a Sioux language, leading to a frustrated Costner threatening to fire them if they didn't. Adding on were the training of the wolves, which proved difficult as they would barely get them to cooperate. The film went over schedule and way over budget, going to $22 million, leading to some Hollywood experts proclaiming it as Kevin's Gate, a reference to Michael Chimino's Heaven's Gate, another film which a decade earlier also struggled with production and went over budget and ultimately failing in theaters. After production, they end up with five hours and a half worth of footage, leading to massive cuts leading to the final product of three hours. All the headache endured during the making of the film would be worth it. Dances with Wolves came to theaters on November 9, 1990 to critical and audience acclaim, earning $184 million in the United States and $240 million everywhere else, bringing it to a grand total of $424,200,000, being one of the highest grossing films in 1990. It was also a big winner at the Oscars, winning in seven categories including Best Picture. It also revitalized the Western genre in Hollywood, leading the way for other successful films such as Unforgiven and Tombstone. Dances with Wolves was the third Best Picture winner for Orion, and is also the highest grossing film. Ending the year, Mermaids was released, a coming-of-age film taking place in 1963 Massachusetts about a single mother and her children dealing with hardships. Based on a Patty Dan novel of the same name, and starring Cher, Bob Hoskins, Winona Ryder, and a 10-year-old Christina Ritchie making her film debut. Coming out on December 14, 1990, Mermaids was positively reviewed and did okay, making back its $31 million budget at 
$35 million. With the ultra-successful Dances with Wolves and little else proving profitable, 1990 was a mixed year for Orion. It was losing money and was just getting deeper in the hole. 1991 didn't have a good beginning with the sci-fi action film Eva Destruction, with Gregory Hines playing a colonel who hopes to stop a rampaging android who is basically a walking nuclear bomb before it's too late. Dutch sex symbol Renee Sultandit makes her U.S. film debut, playing double as the android Eve and her creator Dr. Eve Simmons. Sultandit was a big star in her native Netherlands in the 1980s, and even worked for her fellow Dutch filmmaker Paul Verhoeven, but any hopes she would branch out into international stardom will be dashed as critics base Eva Destruction and Destructed at Theaters after being released on January 18, 1991, making only $5 million on the $13 million budget. Next up, The Silence of the Lambs came out, featuring Anthony Hopkins as a favorite cannibal and killer, Hannibal Lecter. In the movie, Jodie Foster plays as Clarence Starling. An FBI trainee asked to interview Lecter to help bring down a crazed serial killer called Buffalo Bill, played by Ted Levine. Based on a series of novels by Thomas Harris, the Hannibal character first appeared in the novel Red Dragon in 1981, which would make its way to the big screen in 1986's Manhunter, directed by Michael Mann and produced by Italian film producer Dino De Laurentiis. Starring William Peterson as FBI agent Will Graham and Brian Cox as Lecter, Red Dragon was met with positive reviews, but failed at theaters, later on being a cult classic. Later on, in 1988, Harris wrote Silence of the Lambs, which found success with readers and would then become a movie. Prior to the movie's release, Orion got the rights to the movie with Gene Hackman attached to star and direct. Hackman and Orion would split the $500,000 cost. In addition, the studio had to get the rights to the elected character from De Laurentiis, and the producer, put off by Manhunter's lack of success, gave them the rights for free. Brought in to write the script was screenwriter Ted Talley. Just as Talley was halfway through the first draft, Gene Hackman dropped out of the project, but the Ryan heads told him to keep on and let them worry about the rest. For director, they went to Jonathan Demme, who directed Orion's Something Wild and Married to the Mob, and after reading the novel, Dem signed on. For the role of Clarence Starling, they wanted Michelle Pfeiffer, but she got nervous about the subject matter and turned it down. But a willing taker was Jodie Foster, fresh off her Oscar win, where she portrayed a rape victim in the accused. Foster was passionate about Starling, and after Pfeiffer rejected the role, gave it to Foster. For the killer Hannibal Lecter, they went to Sean Connery, but he turned it down. After considering Daniel Day-Lewis and Derek Jacoby, they finally cast Anthony Hopkins, based on his role in The Elephant Man. The main filming took place from November 1989 to March 1990, mainly in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, with some scenes filmed in West Virginia. In a rare act of cooperation, the FBI even let them film scenes at the Academy in Quantico, Virginia, with some FBI members even acting in bit parts. Released in theaters on Valentine's Day 1991, The Silence of the Lambs got positive reviews and in over a week surpassed a $19 million budget. Domestically, the thriller made $130 million and altogether made $272 million, making it one of the highest earners of 1991. Spring 1991 was very bittersweet for Orion. At the 63rd Academy Awards on March 25, 1991, Dances with Wolves seen 12 nominations, winning 7, including Best Director for Costner and Best Pitcher, as aforementioned, making it the third Best Pitcher winner for Orion. However, at the beginning of the ceremonies, the host, Billy Crystal, had some words to say. With a serious illness group, you had Reversal of Fortune, about a woman in a coma, Awakenings, about a man in a coma, and Dances with Wolves, released by Orion, a studio in a coma. So, <laughs> you know, all those. Whoa, I made it, too. NEM, I made it all the way through that joke. The comedian's words were not inaccurate. Despite the win at the Oscars and a big winner with Silence of the Lambs at theaters, Orion's financial situation was getting worse. First, the TV unit, which was not too successful to begin with, was shut down, and then it sold off several film projects including the Addams Family to Paramount Pictures. Shortly after, John Clues dismissed two top Orion executives, including Arthur Krim, and brought in younger executives in hopes to turn the company around. A little later, Orion posted a loss of $48 million based on last year's operations, and it was disclosed that the accounting had hidden the full extent of their losses, 
which led to their shareholders filing several lawsuits. Things were getting uglier. The stars in Orion were about to supernova. Meanwhile, in the movie front, the sequel to FX, entitled FX2, came to theaters on May 10, 1991 with Brian Brown and Brian Danahy reprising their roles from their first film as they investigate the death of a cop. While the reviews weren't great, it did make back its $60 million budget, earning $21 million. Ryan would go into the summer 1991 game, bringing back the crazy duo Bill and Ted and Bill and Ted's bogus journey. Keanu Reeves, Alex Winter, and George Carlin reprised their roles as a conqueror, sends robots to versions of the two to kill the duo. Now dead, the two face off with the Grim Reaper, played by William Sadler, and hope to outsmart him and travel through heaven and hell, and hope to return to the living. Reviews were divided, and the film was a hit, making $38 million on the $20 million budget. Up next is the dark comedy Mystery Date, with Ethan Hawke, Terry Polo, and Brian McNair. Hawke goes on a date with Polo, the next door neighbor, with McNair as his brother, letting him use his car. His brother seems like the perfect guy, but appearances can be deceiving as he was involved in a life of crime and poor Hawk gets caught up in this bad web. The film was released on August 16, 1991 and was panned by critics and flopped, making $6 million. Orion put out its final film of the year on October 18, 1991 with Little Man Tate, with Jodie Foster playing the single mother of a child prodigy who attempts to help him use his gifts as well. After the success with Silence of the Lambs, Jodie Foster stepped up her game big time, starring in it, as well as sitting in the director's chair for the first time. Her directorial debut was proven successful, as Lil' Man Tate got positive reviews and did reasonably well with moviegoers, making $25 million on a $10 million budget. Despite reeling out some profitable movies, none of those would particularly help out the dying Orion. By November, their debts had reached $690 million. They attempted to gain more money by selling the rights to the Hollywood Squares to King World, but that didn't do much for them. Adding insult to injury, the Adams Family came out around this time, becoming a huge hit for Paramount, making $191 million. Ryan saw very little of the profits, due to them only having international rights. One could imagine the heads banging their heads against a wall in frustration. It all came crashing down on December 11, 1991, when Orion filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. They still have more films to distribute, but would have to hold off for now. Around this time, New Line Cinema had an interest to buy Orion. New Line was an independent who made a name for itself, launching a couple of lucrative film franchises including The Nightmare on Elm Street and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles films. New Line acquiring Orion would have been big. By the February 1992, New Line and Orion had announced a deal but where they were struck was the issue of price. They couldn't figure that out and in April 1992, the deal was dropped. Other studios like Republic Pictures and the newly formed Savoy Pictures made their attempts to buy Orion as well, but nothing came of it. Meanwhile, at the 64th Academy Awards on March 30, 1992, the Sons of the Lambs were up for the Big Five. Best Picture, Best Director for Jonathan Dem, Best Actor for Anthony Hopkins, Best Actress for Jodie Foster, and Best Adapted Screenplay for Ted Talley. They won all five, being the third film to do so in the Oscars history. Billy Crystal hosted the Oscars again that year, and once again had some more choice words about Orion. Take a great studio like Orion. A few years back, Orion released Platoon. It wins Best Picture. Amadeus, Best Picture. Last year, they released Dances with Wolves. It wins Best Picture. And this year, Silence of the Lambs, nominated for Best Picture. And they can't afford to have another hit. <laughs> but there's good news and bad news. The good news is Orion was just purchased, and the bad news is it was bought by the House of Representatives. <laughs> the, uh... He sure knows how to kick a company while it's down, doesn't he? Orion only saw three films released in 1992. The dramedy Article 99 with Ray Liotta and Kiefer Sutherland, Shadows and Fog, another Woody Allen film, and Ludfield with Michelle Pfeiffer going to John F. Kennedy's funeral where she befriends a black man and his daughter. All three of these films bomb in a meaningless year for Orion. Around 1993 to 1994, Orion managed to release the films that were held over from 1991 to 1992. Among the first was The Dark Half, directed by horror king George A. Romero and based on a Stephen King novel of the same name. 
Timothy Hutton plays an author whose alter ego attempts to take him over. The Dark Half was released on April 23, 1993. Critics were mixed and the movie unperformed, making $10.6 million of its $15 million budget. On November 5, 1993, Arrival once again stick the keys into the ignition with the Robocop franchise with Robocop 3, with Frank Miller penning the script alongside Fred Decker, who also directed. Peter Weller declined to don the suit, with Robert John Berg taking his place. In the third movie, Robocop squares off with ruthless land developers who try to push people out of town. Critics trashed the movie, with the points including Peter Weller's presence being mixed and the film being more family friendly. This was rated PG-13, in contrast to the first two that were rated R. Movie growers agreed as well. Robocop 3 failed to make back its $22 million budget and pulled in $10 million and is generally regarded as the worst of the series. No, we're not counting that one. Car 54 Where Are You was released on January 28, 1994 and was based on the 60 sitcom of the same name and stars David Johansson, John C. McGinley, Fran Drescher, Nipsey Russell, Rosie O'Donnell, and Al Lewis, who starred in the original sitcom. Reviews weren't so kind, and it bombed, just making $1.7 million on its $10 million budget. Clifford is a comedy with Martin Short playing the titular role. Clifford is a 10-year-old mischief maker who stays with his uncle, played by Charles Grodin, and raises hell with them. Released on April Fool's Day 1994, Clifford was a real fool at the box office, being badly reviewed and also tanking at $7.4 million on the movie's $19 million budget. All of those films bombed, and Orion released more films those two years, such as Me and the Kid, a comedy where a robber takes a kid hostage with Denny Aiello, Playmaker, a mystery thriller with Colin Firth and Jennifer Rubin, China Moon, a neo-noir with Ed Harris and Madeline Stowe, The Favor, a romantic comedy with Harley Jane Kozak, Elizabeth McGovern, Bill Pullman, Brad Pitt, and Ken Wall. There Goes My Baby, a period piece with Rick Schroeder and Dermot Mulroney, and Blue Sky, the last film from esteemed British filmmaker Tony Richardson. And the results were the same. Bomb, 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 bomb. It seemed like Orion would go quietly after the failure of all these films. Another business venture would be made in 1994 when Streamline Pictures signed a deal with Orion. Streamline Pictures is known for releasing English dub Japanese animation features. Thinking getting involved with a major studio would help them out, they went to Orion. But it would hurt them bad, as they made a deal with the devil. Orion vetoed new acquisitions from the anime company as well as not renewing any distribution licenses Streamline had. The policy Streamline went through squeezed the life out of them bad leading them to shut down in 2002. 1994 will also have some sad news for Orion. On September 21, Arthur B. Krim, one of the original founders of Orion, died that year at the age of 84. Throughout 94 to 95, the studio faded into obscurity. In 1996, Orion will once again resurface, emerging out of bankruptcy, wasting no time in releasing films, even serving as a distributor for a few of live entertainment's outputs. Some of the more post-bankruptcy output include live entertainment's The Substitute, with Tom Berenger as a Vietnam vet going undercover as a high school substitute teacher to fight a gang. Released on April 19, 1996, the movie's reviews were mixed, but was a modest success, earning $14 million. The movie was spawned three direct-to-video sequels, all with Treat Williams taking over for Tom Berenger. A Heads in a Duffel Bag is a dark comedy with Joe Pesci playing a mob hit man who's, well, eight heads in a duffel bag gets mixed up in an airport and Pesci needing to retrieve them. Released on April 18, 1997, critics panned the movie and it broke even with a budget at $3 million. The independent film Yuli's Gold came out on June 13, 1997 and was produced by Jonathan Demme and directed by Victor Nunez. Peter Fonda stars as Yuli Jackson a family man who helps his imprisoned son find his wife. He finds her and brings her home. Struggles happen in the family as well as hoodlums, former friends of his son, looking for a stash of cash. The drama co-stars Patricia Richardson, Christine Dunford, Tom Wood, and Jessica Biel. The movie was met with positive reviews and did well at the box office, earning $9 million on a $2 million budget 
as well as being the centerpiece premiere for the 1997 Sundance Film Festival. For his role as Yuli, Henry Fonda will win the Golden Globe as well as seeing an Oscar nomination for Best Actor. The crime thriller Gang Related had James Belushi and Tupac Shakur as two corrupt cops who accidentally kill a DEA agent and hope to cover their tracks, which includes convincing Dennis Quaid as a homeless drunk he killed the agent. This will be the final film role for Tupac Shakur, the rapper who was fatally shot a year before the movie was released on October 8, 1997. It earned mixed reviews and made $5 million. Other films released through 1996 up to the summer 1997 include Original Gangsta, The Arrival, Fat Beach, Retroactive, City of Industry, and Behind Enemy Lines. None of these were big renters as Orion was about to be bought out. Throughout the 1990s, Metro Media acquired other film companies including the Samuel Goldwyn Company and the Motion Picture Corporation of America. But by 1997, Metro Media was about to beat its final heartbeats. In July of that year, the shareholders of Metro Media sold all three of the film companies to Metro Goldwyn Mayer, which led to several employees withdrawing as well as over a hundred being laid off over a period of nine months, leading 25 of them to work for the bigger film studio. After the sale of the film companies, Metro Media shut down. In 1998, Motion Picture Corporation of America separated itself from MGM. Under MGM, Orion released his last movie until 1999, with titles such as The Locust, Best Men, Storefront Hitchcock, Music from Another Room, Phantasm Oblivion, and the last movie, One Man's Hero. After releasing their last slate of movies, Orion would be folded to MGM and would act as the holding company for the studio. Not only Orion's own library, but also for the Samuel Goen titles. In 1999, MGM acquired the pre-1996 Polygram Library from Seagram's, the then owner of Universal Studios. With this, MGM also got the rights to the films from Embassy Nelson, the pre-1994 Castle Rock Entertainment films, and the Hemdale movies, including The Terminator and Platoon, which Orion did not own, but everything else would come full circle as MGM consolidated those movies into Orion. These days, MGM owns the post-1982 Orion library, including the AIP and Filmways input with a few exceptions. Lionheart, Amadeus, and the unbearable lightness of being are owned by Warner Brothers, who also own the films that they originally distributed with Orion, including Ten, Caddyshack, and Excalibur, with exceptions including the two Woody Allen movies, A Midnight Summer's Sex Comedy, and Z-League, which rests with MGM. HBO owns home video and paid TV rights to The Three Amigos, as they co-produce the film. The other rights to the film are with MGM. Studio Canal Plu owns First Blood after acquiring the Kuroko Pictures Library and the live entertainment movies including The Substitute, The Arrival, and Fat Beach, which are owned by Lionsgate. And now for the big question. How did Orion Pictures, a studio who released some of the most crowd-pleasing films of the era, as well as a few Oscar winners, rise and fall? They were, after all, backed by men who enjoyed great success at United Artists, but when branching out on their own, they struggled. Mainly it was several bad decisions, first with the marketing, botching such potential hits including The Great Santini and Prince of the City. If you want people to see those films, you gotta put them out there for the world to see. Despite this, they made it okay, winning Oscars and earning critical prestige, and for a brief moment, they could have been considered a major. But eventually, they released flop after flop, just building mountains of debt. You could also create it to bad decisions, like attempting to start their own James Bond with Grimo Williams, and let's not go into UHF. They did achieve more Academy success with the one-two punch of Dances with the Wolves and Silence of the Lambs. But by then it was too late, as they went into bankruptcy. Even though they did manage to climb out of it, Orion would be a shell of its former self, putting out films that they didn't have any real winners, and by the time MGM came along and acquired them, they had no real use for them, just using them as a holder for the library acquisitions. To sum it all up, Ryan was a company with big ideas. While some of them would pan out, others not only failed, but failed miserably. They were the Homer Simpson of Hollywood. Do no. indeed. Do indeed. In 2013, MGM revived Orion's television unit 
producing the syndicated series Paternity Court, which proved successful enough they would use Orion to produce the more specialty flair of MGM, including Grace Unplugged with Lionsgate, the Brazilian film Vestido Pra César, The Town That Dreaded Sundown, Tell, We'll Never Have Paris, Larry Gay, Renegade Male Fly Attendant, Balls Out, and Fort Tilden. These days, the new Orion is keeping a more lower profile and it's probably for the best, as Orion can't afford to go big now, especially since their parent company MGM has its share of financial woes, which even led to them going to bankruptcy, but we'll discuss MGM at another time. Orion would be best known as a major wannabe who had their moments in the stars, but got trumped by a lot of bad decisions. But you cannot deny they put out some of the more entertaining films of their times. Something to make you laugh, something to make you cry, and something to thrill you. Orion may not be going back to the top anytime soon, but we still wish them for longevity, and hopes Orion could churn out more entertaining movies and moviegoers for years to come.